Well, uh, I guess we're going to start then. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, my name is Michaela. I'm from the communication team, and I'm going to be helping out with this Q&A session with uh, the WEC. Uh, with me, I have Helm Goodyear, who is the leader of the Ethics Committee, and Blake Thompson, who is a senior member of the Ethics Committee. And uh, I'm going to be basically your guys' voice through the through the chat, uh, I'm gonna be reading it and uh, if something comes up, I'll uh, include it. Um, but it's mainly the two guys who's gonna be answering the questions. Um, so I guess we'll start out with the first question, uh, which, which is about what is the WEC and uh, what's, the, what's your scope? Yeah, so, the WEC stands for the WCA Ethics Committee, um, and essentially our role is to investigate any allegations or concerns um, against staff members from the WCA, whether that is uh, delegates, which most people are familiar with interacting, or if it's staff members from another team or committee, um, we also handle appeals against uh, actions taken by the disciplinary committee. Um, so for example, if somebody receives a ban from the disciplinary committee, but the person banned thinks it was uh, an incorrect decision, they appeal to the board and the board tell us to investigate uh, again and then see if that decision should be uh, withheld or overturned. Um, Another thing we do is communicate to the delegates to find out if they have conflicts of interest. Um, so for example, if they have a personal sponsorship, we encourage them to uh, not allow that to get in the way of organizers they work with and choosing a sponsor for their competitions, things like that. Um, we do that by creating, we've created a code of ethics, um, which is publicly available on the website. Um, and all delegates and WTA staff have consented to agree by this, and that's the standard you can expect our staff to uphold. Um, so if you ever see anything from a WTA staff member that you think doesn't conform to that code of ethics, you will be able to email us, and then we can look into it further from there. So that's the initial thing that you're doing? Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so uh, how do you then uh, work? How, what, how do you do that when you then continue with it? So the general process of an investigation after it's brought to us. Um, so essentially anybody, any registered speaker can bring an investigation to us and we will also focus on anonymity. So. If you're bringing up an accusation of a WCA staff member and you would like to remain anonymous throughout the investigation uh, within whoever we contact, we'll make sure to keep your name out of it if that's what you so desire. Um, also, uh, a focus on uh, our scope of WCA staff. Um, there are a lot of times where we get emails about people referencing people who don't fall within the scope of WCA staff. So, uh, for instance, a very prominent one is uh, WC organizers uh, who are not uh, often not delegates or uh, committee or team members. Uh, and so from then on, uh, after we receive an investigation, we contact the senior delegate. And at this point, we'll kind of uh, reach out to a few of the people who are involved or might know something more than we do about this case. And that will kind of help us gauge whether uh, this is a case where we can take, because even if it's uh, pertaining to WCA staff, sometimes it doesn't seem too much like a breach of, of the code of ethics. And um, there are a lot of times where we have to uh, kind of uh, collaborate with uh, the WDC, the WCA disciplinary committee uh, to kind of tie in uh, both of our scopes to ultimately reach a conclusion on the case. And so from this point, we'll, uh, if we decide that, that we can take this, that we can take this case, uh, we'll decide the lead members. So generally for each investigation, we have about two members uh, on each case because um, most of uh, those who work with the WCA are doing it um, on the side of whatever they do in their normal life. So 
there are times where, where things are busy, you know, you can't handle workload. Uh, so it helps to also have somebody to discuss uh, the case with uh, more closely, um, but also just in the event that somebody's busy, the case doesn't come to a standstill. So. Uh, we'll also communicate to the board that this case has begun. And from then on, we'll keep on co uh, consistent communication with the board to let them know about how the case is proceeding. Um, and so uh, from this point, uh, we've kind of started the ground of the, the formalized ground of, of this case. And so we'll contact the accused staff member um, kind of based on the information we have so far to kind of verify or refute what we already know, make sure that um, to kind of get, get their perspective on, on, on this issue that was brought up to us. And this is kind of like a free flowing process throughout. It's uh, kind of like back and forth discussion with everybody who pertains to this case, including the staff member and the senior delegate, um, and then also discussing within the committee to kind of gauge other opinions. We have outside of me and Callum, um, I believe six or seven other members. So it really helps uh, also with the uh, different geographic backgrounds uh, to have varying perspectives on these cases. And so uh, once we think we've reached a final conclusion, uh, we'll take a vote and we'll communicate the decision to uh, the board, uh, the accused staff member, and the individual who brought the case to us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we got a question in the chat about how um, case reports are made. So um, where will you get reports about cases from? So we make a report for every case. Um, usually uh, the cases where we do send or show the report to somebody else are very special cases uh, where it's absolutely necessary, but generally they're not publicly available. Uh, but I would assume that if there was a, a valid reason for us to make um, a separate public report, we would do so. But to this moment, we haven't really had um, much of, of a case where, where that was necessary. Um. So I guess we'll uh, move on to the next question coming up. So um, in the near future, would there be a separate or combined code of ethics that includes staff members of regional organizations? Um, so here, there's an interesting distinction that I think is often lost on uh, the majority of our community. And that is that the WCA itself doesn't organize competitions. We just govern the results. We ensure that if there's a delegate present and the regulations are followed, then these results can be accepted as WCA official results. Um, so the regional organizations obviously help with that. Uh, they're able to organize on a ground level because they know their area, they can find venues and do all the rest of it that actually needs for a competition to be organized. Uh, quite often there's a lot of overlap with delegates in the region also being involved with those regional organizations. So to an extent we already have some members of regional organizations agreeing to this code of ethics. Um, if something was reported to us about, um, you know, a regional organization that did seem off to us, uh, depending on the severity of the case, we could always uh, recommend to the board that their regional organization status as recognized by the WCA be looked into and potentially removed until they show that they're performing actions which are more in alignment with the spirit and mission of the WCA as a whole. Um, but as far as our jurisdiction, we hope that people involved with the regional organizations help to hold those regional organizations to a high standard because, you know, it's if it's your community, you should be providing your best to it and also making sure that those in charge are also helping provide the best to it. So could you see in the future that maybe to be a recognized uh, regional organization that all the board members of that regional organization would have to like sign on the code of ethics the way that WCA staff members have to? Um, well, currently there's... Uh, a bit of uh, back and forth discussion about how we should be handling regional organizations. Um, the, the board recently have discussed um, getting uh, all regional organizations that are recognized have to be registered as, um, I think, nonprofit organizations in their country. 
Um, this can take some time, so it's not going to be implemented anytime soon. Um, but as the progression of regional organizations becomes more prominent, and especially with organizing their major championships, it's something that uh, we can probably discuss with the board and see how to proceed as they want to proceed in the future with the regional organizations. Um, and as we've got uh, a decent amount of uh, new viewers, maybe um, it would be relevant to um, take out what the WEC does again, like what, what the scope is, just so uh, everyone here is uh, aware of that. Yeah, so we uh, write, we, we, well, we wrote and we maintain the Code of Ethics, uh, which is a document all WCA staff uh, must abide by um, to have their role as staff. Um, we also handle investigations when there are potential breaches um, against this Code of Ethics into yeah, either delegates or team and committee members. Um, and then we also handle appeals against the disciplinary committee decisions if a registered speedkeeper was to take issue with um, the resolution to a disciplinary committee case against them. Yeah. Um, and so I think we should move on to, uh, to the next lined up question. Um, which is uh, someone who commented about a cheating scandal that happened at a competition in 2018 that they uh, haven't heard anything about and uh, hasn't been solved. Uh, what do you have to say about that? Yeah, so uh, yeah, thank you to the person who actually uh, wrote this one. Um, it provided uh, some good feedback to us because when this was raised to us, uh, the ethics committee was actually uh, non-functioning so we transferred this case to the disciplinary committee which is part of the motions if the disciplinary committee is non-functioning then we take their cases and if we're non-functioning then the disciplinary committee take our cases and basically what happened is that by providing the anonymity towards the person who directed this question to us we did not tell the disciplinary committee that it came from them um, because that's how we work. We oh, we protect the source of uh, claims against staff members, uh, you know, for their privacy. Um, so when the WDC actually concluded that case and sent their resolution to the board, they uh, didn't uh, inform us, unfortunately. And uh, the person who was uh, in charge of that case for the ethics committee before it got transferred to the disciplinary committee, um, unfortunately, is no longer uh, with the ethics committee. So they also weren't able to ping uh, the disciplinary committee and get a response from them. Uh, I've since been in contact with the disciplinary committee about this case and I read the report that they wrote for it. So we'll be uh, getting back to the person who raised that case to us uh, with the resolution that the disciplinary committee provided. Hmm. And uh, I think that's a, a good thing um, to explain like how cases are handled um, with the anonymity um, right that it, it's not something that really gets discussed um, but would you ever consider doing um, doing like a um, like blogs about what you're doing uh, the same way that the disciplinary com committee is doing uh, well fortunately many of our cases um, actually result in just uh, some guidance as to how better um, deal with situations that delegates or other staff members have found themselves in. Uh, we deal with very gray areas um, within the organization. It's not quite as black and white as breaking the regulations knowingly and therefore you've cheated. Um, it's pretty tricky, the stuff uh, we have to discuss. Um, occasionally we get um, cases that it's not sure if it's uh, like borderline unethical or if it's just a quality issue. Maybe they didn't know that things could be done another way. And so we coordinate with the Quality Assurance Committee and get them to update uh, the staff member on how to do things better in the future. Um, for this reason, uh, a public uh, log or digest um, probably isn't the best way to go. But if we did have a case large enough um, and with enough um, you know, meaning to the public and to the registered speakers, then we would publish that 
Um, in, in such a large case, we would coordinate with uh, the disciplinary committee probably. Um, and then either ourselves or the disciplinary committee would be publishing such a report. So if you see something like that being published, then it's probably had both of us working towards its conclusion. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I, I think that answers that question. Um, so I guess we'll move on to talk about um, financial things with competitions um, and the question is whether delegates should allow organizers to hook up their Stripe accounts to competitions um, so that the organizers will be in control of the funds. Yeah, so this has been a pretty prevailing question within the WDC uh, since I've been a part of it. And to at least uh, start within the topic of, of um, financial concerns for competitions, uh, we've started to implement budgets uh, for competitions. So right now we're in the process of standardizing that so that when a competition is announced, uh, you would submit a budget along with it. Um, but at the moment, we're kind of encouraging uh, organizers to provide some form of a budget to their delegates so that they're aware of what kind of finances are involved um, and mostly to prevent any tendency for, uh, for surprises in, in finances when you realize something's more expensive than it really is, or there's some costs that the organizer didn't communicate. Um, so that's kind of designed to um, combat the issue of uh, the dangers in, in uh, organizers essentially not having enough uh, funding to from the registration fees to cover the cost of the competition, because those should be in some form of a balance where uh, the registration fees you receive from the competition um, pay off the costs that you would take on for the venue, the equipment, um, and in certain cases, uh, travel for the delegate. Um, but as far as allowing the organizers to, to have uh, control of a Stripe account and receive the excess funds, it's kind of a, a touchy topic. It varies from region to region. Um, at the moment, we currently have uh, the stance of any funds uh, that are received from a competition should be used uh, for the, the advancement of the community. So say if uh, that's towards uh, holding another competition in the area or uh, supplying the, the community with more equipment, or I guess in certain cases, uh, prizes for, for competitors, say like uh, new competitors get um, a really cool cube, that, that'd be really encouraging for people to get into competitions. Um, but uh, this kind of, branches into the question of, of uh, or the introduction of regional organizations who oversee these competitions um, and handle the funds. Uh, for instance, I'm from the US, so so one that uh, that's pretty close to me is Cubing USA. And so Cubing USA supported competitions, the funds go through Cubing USA. So the organizer isn't taking on any burden of paying off of all these costs or perhaps running into debt. So I think that's the bigger area to hit. Um, it would be difficult to completely forbid organizers from having control of a Stripe account um, because there are regional issues across uh, the scope of the WCA. But um, I think in general, um, I wouldn't see such a strict process like that. Um, I think there will certainly uh, be cases where the organizer should be in, in possession of, of a Stripe account. Um, if uh, perhaps there's uh, some kind of um, push to to spark a regional organization in the area that would eventually possess those funds. But if Callum wants to join in and uh, kind of... Yeah, actually, I think the main, the main point here is if you're a delegate, get a budget from your organizer. Um, if they're first time organizer, definitely get a budget from them. If they're a multiple time organizer, they should already have a standard budget and they should know what the, what kind of expenses to be incurring. And if you're someone who is organizing or wants to organize, have a budget for your delegate. It, it makes them know that you're serious about it. It makes them know that you understand the costs and incomes that you're going to have for your competition. And it just makes everything a lot easier. Uh, there'll be fewer unexpected uh, surprises happening on the weekend or the week before or after the competition itself. Um, it just makes things a lot smoother and easier. Mm -hmm. So um, 
you're talking about just allowing organizers to um, to set up the Stripe accounts. Would there then have to be any um, security measures to know that the organizers aren't collecting money for themselves, or uh, how how would you handle that? Yeah, that's a uh, that's kind of the design of the budget, right? So that the delegate and the organizer are in agreement of what finances will go into this competition. And if there is access, the delegate will know how much access. Um, so ideally, um, no degree of finances should go completely under the radar. Um, so that's kind of our, our first stepping stone to, to resolving that issue. Um, perhaps, well, we're, at the moment, we're kind of going forward with that, right? Like I said, um, um, like implementing budgets when, when you announce competitions. So I think at this moment, we'll test that out and see how that pans out. Um, if we think there are further issues, we might have to lean more towards um, forbidding organizers from having sole possession of Stripe accounts. But at the moment, um, I think our focus should be on, on the budgets. Very clear. Um, I guess we'll move on to uh, the next que question in the line, which is, uh, can the organizer see the report or part of the report the delegate sends out for the competition? Um, so this is something that gets brought up uh, not too frequently, but every so often. Um, as an organizer looking uh, for feedback, uh, the best thing to do is just to write or talk to your delegate about it and say, uh, what did I do well? Uh, or what did we do well? Um, what could be improved? Um, are there any things uh, you know that we can think about already doing for next time? Um, and it's not just the delegate who can give you this kind of feedback. It's also you know people who attended your competition. So you know find out if they enjoyed it, what what they liked specifically about it, so you can give that to the, more to the community. Um, the other things that are within delegate reports uh, are incidents you know for example if somebody uh, got a strange plus two they might need clarification from the regulations committee about if it is meant to be a plus two or if it's a dnf if the regulations don't quite cover it so clearly um, these kind of things they're not really relevant for the organizers because the organizers can't be dealing with uh, deciding you know dnfs and extras and uh, well dns yes but extras uh, things like that no um, and then sometimes there's internal discussion about uh, issues. You know, if you had um, people not judging enough, um, what to do, how how we can uh, encourage people to be more active in assisting at competitions. Um, but as far as that goes for the local community scope and the uh, the scope of an organizer, that's more on the ground level. You can probably actually get more information by talking to the people involved in that situation. You know, if you've seen someone during the weekend who you know, and they weren't judging as much as you expected or as much as you would have liked, you could ask them, hey, were you just having a bad weekend? You know, stuff like that. Um, but there's not really much uh, much sense in getting organizers uh, to see a carbon copy of the report, because then it could also lead to delegates, um, you know, modifying their report, maybe not lying on their reports, but not telling the whole truth if maybe they had an unpleasant experience with the organizer. Um, and also, you know, if, if the delegate did have an unpleasant experience with you, they're normally willing to also give it another go as long as you're willing to learn. So if they're writing something in the report about, oh, you know, they're, they weren't very focused during the competition, they were focused on the results more than uh, actually keeping the thing running, then you can just ask them if there's anything they can improve and hope that they're being honest with you. And then you can try and fix, uh, fix things that they would, would have written about anyway. So you can get the same information without needing to see a, a carbon copy of the report. Mm. Yeah. And that's not really what the reports are, are meant to be about. Um, mm. so that makes sense. Uh, maybe um, Blake can speak more to that as a delegate, if he has uh, anything to add. Yeah, I mean, uh, one thing I was thinking about is if you're very interested in seeing delegate reports, a great way to get introduced to those is uh, join a committee. Uh, <laughs> but um, yeah, I definitely do echo the sentiment of um, you can gain as much, if not more, information from just speaking with your delegate. I know when I first started taking an active role in competitions, I was very 
nervous about what would be discussed about me in, in the Delhi reports. Now, looking back, there wasn't much. But um, yeah, uh, there's really nothing to fear uh, if you do have concerns with how the competition operated. I think it's in your best interest to just work it out with your delegate, um, see if, uh, if you plan on doing a competition in the future, um, see if they have any recommendations for things you could change. Um, and I think that pretty much sums up. Um, yeah, I mean, I, like I said, I, I think a lot of this comes out of fear and, and you don't have to be afraid. There's not as much uh, trash talk going on within the, the Dose Day Delegate reports as, as people might think. It's, it's all designed to be constructive. I think it's this a similar feeling as uh, when you're a first timer, you're not sure how, how the experience will be um, as a first time competitor. And everyone turns out that they love their first competition and made a bunch of new friends. It's the same with first time organizing. You think it's going to go like, terribly maybe. And actually <laughs> like when, when delegates do reference an organizer being good or bad, the vast, vast majority are always, I will work with this organizer again. And you know, in the cases where it's there were some mistakes, it's it's followed by, but we've discussed it and we know how to progress and make sure it doesn't happen again next time. So it's just like competing; it gets better. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, I guess we'll uh, we'll move on to the next question. Um, the types of cases that keep reoccurring, and have you? Uh, considered to implement new general guidelines to prevent those common incidents? Yeah, uh, so... Um, oh. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, I, I think you're about to hit the same point, being uh, that the code of ethics is updated to reflect cases that we actually encounter. Um, yeah, and apart from that, you know, uh, we did a, a, a quick news blast um, last week or two weeks ago, um, just about stuff that's been going on. Uh, that was staff-wide, not public. Um, just to let staff know, hey, these are a couple of trends um, that we've noticed and we've been getting emails about. Um, uh, the other kind of trends that we get are actually questions from delegates, you know, saying, uh, for example, hey, I've been approached by this company. They want to sponsor me as a competitor. Um, can you give me some advice? How, how do I proceed with this? Is, are there any issues I should be looking out for? And we can just expand upon points in the code of ethics, uh, you know, tell them, you know, just be wary that if you're sponsored as a competitor, that you, when you're working with an organizer, you let the organizer choose the, uh, how to acquire a sponsor, who to sponsor their competition, if they want one. Um, questions like that from delegates. Um, we haven't had too much um, of a theme with reoccurrence apart from the budget stuff. Um, and that's why we're looking to implement a software solution for organizers and delegates um, for that. That should be coming uh, quite shortly. That was also in the in the news blast. So uh, yeah, stay tuned for that if you're an organizer or a delegate. Yeah, and uh, now you mentioned the thing about sponsorships. Um, that's often something that that people don't really understand. So maybe um, elaborate a bit on on uh, what the stand is in sponsorships. In the ethics committee. Do you want to take that one, Blake? Um, so this is referring to sponsorships. Hmm. Yeah. Uh, so that's a bit of a touchy topic. Um, this was kind of one of the one of the first issues that was tackled in, in my time in the WEC. Um, essentially, the, I, I always think back to the perspective of, of my first competition. You know, um, it was much smaller than they are now. But surely, when you're going to your first competition and say you're you're younger. You really look up to those really fast people, the competition, but also that person in charge, you think they're really in charge. You know, they have a lot of power. They, they know exactly what's going on. And um, at, at the time I started competing, there weren't really sponsors or anything of that nature. But I always think that if, uh, say my, uh, my delegate um, who I really looked up to was wearing um, a sweatshirt from, from a cube retailer, I would think, wow, I should buy my cubes from there. And so that's kind of like the broad example I, I relate back to. Um, but I think there should be some kind of separation between um, uh, aspects that are more related to your uh, competitiveness, competitiveness within uh, cubing and the work you do with the WCA. Uh, those two should remain separate as much as possible. And it's, it's difficult to, to find some kind of a balance because 
uh, we have plenty of cases where uh, delegates are really, really fast and, and sponsored. And um, uh, there's obviously some some who are less accepting of um, our general in, like sentiment that you should try to separate the two aspects of, of your time within the WCA as much as possible. Um, and so this kind of ties back into uh, the code of ethics and how um, when when we first debuted uh, at this point, a lot of people were very um, angry, I guess, about it. And so we're kind of trying to take in uh, the situation as we go, uh, see how we can modify uh, this exact laws to accommodate uh, competitors and well, WCA staff as best as possible. But um, yeah, uh, Helen wants to continue. Um, yeah, so I think obviously when once you become a WCA staff member, you've probably been around the community for a significant amount of time already, um, especially if you're becoming a delegate. Um, and that leads, I think, many staff members to kind of forget what it feels like when you were attending your first competitions. As Blake said, you know, if you turn up and see and get told, you know, hey, this person is the person from the WCA, they need to, you know, they're the ones that make the calls. If you have any problems or like a regulation question, ask them. Uh, they're the ones doing the introduction to competing. Um, so if you go away and have a really good weekend and then remember, oh, they were wearing this hoodie the entire weekend. I'm going to go and buy all my cubes from them to support the WCA. It kind of implies this connection between the WCA and a sponsor, well, a sponsor of that person as a competitor. And, you know, the sponsor hasn't paid for that. They haven't worked out an agreement for an affiliation between them and the WCA. Um, and that could happen in the future between the WCA and the company. So it's unfair to allow a company to kind of buy their way in through a delegate. Um, you know, primarily if some, if a company underhandedly wanted to do that, then that's what we're avoiding. Uh, so I'm just going to ask a clarifying question. So are delegates allowed to wear sponsored gear? Um, so currently the phrasing is that they shouldn't be wearing clothing, which should be reasonably interpret, which could be reasonably interpreted as an official uh, affiliation or agreement with the WCA. Um, the exception to this is while they're competing, they're free to wear their personal sponsorship uh, attire. Obviously, that's um, part of the contract that many of these uh, fast competitors sign is that they will be wearing the logos, for example, while they're competing because that's what the sponsor is paying for, right? If, if they're getting fast times, then that's, that's what gets uploaded to YouTube. That's what gets seen on social media. And, you know, if they're sponsored for that, then yeah, fair play. But yeah. uh, as far as the delegate role goes, that this is um, this is all volunteer work we do as WCA staff. Um, we're very thankful to everyone who volunteers their time. Um, and yeah, it's uh, good to see them putting that into the community and not uh, you know being able to separate that from their personal competitor side, as Blake said. Um, so. On the line of sponsorship, um, what about sponsored competitions? When a competition gets a sponsor, um, what's the opinion on, on that kind of stuff? And are there any um, guidelines of how that should be done? So ideally, the organizer of the competition should determine the sponsor of that competition. And I think that's something most people are in agreement with. Because uh, if the delegate owns a cube store, say, or is sponsored by a cube store, we don't want them to push on, on the organizer that, okay, this competition has to be sponsored by this cube store. Um, so that's the prevailing issue. We want the organizer to have primary freedom in, in determining who they want to kind of endorse this competition. Um, and there are certain cases where the organizer might choose a sponsor that we think might not be in the, in the best interest of all competitors. And those are very special cases. Um, so in, in the event that something like that happens um, and it is brought to our attention, we usually take it on a case-by-case -case basis and determine whether uh, this, this might be taking it too far. Um, but in general, uh, this is something that, that has been uh, pretty straightly followed. Um, the organizer or the delegate kind of takes the role of, of coordinating these competitions, but the organizer takes the role of uh, 
finding the sponsor, you know, uh, getting the venue, creating the schedule, all that kind of stuff. So that's kind of been sorted into the responsibility of organizers. Yeah. Um, so I think we got through that pretty well. Um, um, I'm sorry, there was another kind of sub question within that. I thought uh, there were two interpretations. Uh, there are some competitions where you know, the sponsor gets their logo. If they sponsor the competition, they end up with their uh, logo on the T-shirt. Um, and yeah. if it's a T-shirt like that, that's uh, competition specific. That's not uh, competitor specific. So delegates uh, or WCA staff members uh, wearing those at competitions while they're performing their staff roles is uh, is fine because that's not uh, them advertising that, you know, the, the sponsor has paid for their logo to be on that kind of T-shirt and it's not... Uh, it's not as clear cut an issue as uh, the other one where it's the delegate being sponsored because they're a fast competitor. Um, so um, you think you talked enough about sponsorship? <laughs> <laughs> Perhaps, but uh, well, ask, ask if, the chat. <laughs> yeah, if uh, uh, I mean, there, there's a lot of opinions in the chat, but not necessarily questions. Um, so yeah, I think uh, also, if uh, if you have a question pertaining to sponsorships, so oh, if, if you if you have any questions about sponsorship, yeah. write them in the chat yeah. and we'll uh, we'll raise them. Um, oh, actually, right now uh, one came in. Um, so, what what's the opinion on competitions that have um, the sponsor brand in the name? Is that something oh. that's completely okay and? Uh, that's uh, that's allowed by the uh, competition requirement policy, uh, if I'm not mistaken. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, that's uh, again, if that's something that this is within the agreement um, mm -hmm. between the sponsor and the organizer, um, and the WCA accepts the name because it doesn't contradict um, any of the competition requirement policy, um, then that's uh, that's fine by us. Um. So now we're gonna change the uh, change subject a bit and uh, talk about price money. Um, so the question is, um, uh, is it a problem when people make sure that their main event has the most price money? This isn't really an issue that's been brought to our attention. Um, and it's uh, it's kind of one of those edge cases, right? Because this would mostly pertain to the organizer. That's the individual who would be in charge of, or likely in charge of associating the prize money. Um, so obviously that's not within our scope because we only pertain to WCA staff, which includes any form of delegate um, and committee and team members. So I think this would be something that uh, would be kind of one of those case by case basis. Um, and I think we would have to look into um, some form of collaboration with a different committee because it's not directly within our scope or just completely pass it on to them. Yeah. So if, if, um, if someone were to do that and uh, then people could write into you and be like, hey, we don't, we think this is a little bit sketchy. Yeah, um, as, as a general policy, you know, if uh, if you have a concern relating to a competition and you're not sure whether it's exactly within our scope, you can always feel free to reach out. Um, if the worst case scenario is, is we'll point you in the right direction, forward it to the relevant committee, uh, but you shouldn't be afraid of um, a particular concern or question not being within our scope. Um, so we got another question from chat. Is there any guidelines for trainee delegates that the WEC has set up? Uh, so for uh, for trainee delegates, that's uh, there's actually a thing called the crash course, um, and that's where newer delegates can read um, about the steps that go into you know helping organizers with getting WCA official competitions set up, um, completed, and then the results submitted. Um, that's not really our scope. That's uh, something more to do with the Quality Assurance Committee. Um, they've just taken on a few new members, so hopefully they'll be uh, even producing more documentation for delegates to read. 
Um, and also, you know, delegates get uh, assistance from their region leads or their senior delegates or delegates in their area who know, um, you know, how to run stuff already if they've been within the role for a longer time. Um, apart from that, it's not really our scope. Uh, we check that, you know, they have declared any conflicts of interest that they may have to us. Um, apart from that, we, uh, you know, we, we do a, a small background check on them uh, before they're promoted uh, to full delegate um, from candidate delegate or uh, in this guy, as the new, uh, the new way will go from trainee delegate to full delegate. Um, so we basically uh, check there if they've been the subject of an investigation and, you know, 99% of the time they haven't and we just tell the senior, yep, looks good. You can uh, feel free to promote them. Um, but as far as guidelines go, that's something uh, mainly for the quality assurance committee to write. And then actually, you know, uh, as I said earlier, sometimes we get issues sent to us where it's a bit borderline if it's, if it would be unethical, if it was intended to be done that way. But many times it's just, you know, a lack of the knowledge in the first place. And maybe, you know, people in different regions do things differently. Um, that's one of the biggest problems we have as a worldwide organization, actually. Um, so standardizing is sometimes uh, difficult and oftentimes not actually possible. You know, some things in some parts of the world just don't work in other parts of the world. Um, so yeah, that's more the quality assurance committee scope than the ethics committee. Mm -hmm. So uh, there's no specific thing that you've done um, for trained delegates. No. Okay. <laughs> so uh, if we move on to another question from chat, um, uh, do you see a delegate competing at their own competition as a conflict of interest? I would not say so. Um, I think that would discourage a lot of people from taking the role of, of a delegate. So. At this moment, and even within the foreseeable future, I don't see that being the case. Um, we uh, we like to be fairly uh, open in, in the sense of um, most people who would take the role of delegates are really into competing. Um, we're all within this hobby for the same reason, you know, uh, some for different reasons. But I think that uh, yeah, I mean, uh, there's there's no reason to forbid it at this moment. Um, we have the code of ethics for a reason to, um, in the event that uh, a delegate, for instance, is, is taking the role of competition and violates some kind of clause um, that will be handled, but that really doesn't overlap with competing. So I think if there were to be issues with a delegate taking a competing role, um, that would be handled on, on a case by case basis, but I definitely don't agree that uh, <laughs> completely forbidding it is, is the best line of action at this moment. Uh, there would be the cases where, you know, a delegate could possibly be giving themselves extras for really small things or, you know, in the really worst case scenario, they're looking at the scrambles beforehand. Um, but, you know, delegates acquire that position by already having contributed towards their community, either by organizing or being part of a regional organization before. Um, they're normally very active within the community and trustworthy, which is why they get offered the position and why they choose to take the position. Um, if you've seen anything suspicious at a competition, you can always email us. We, our contact email is, uh, is on the WCA website under teams and committees. Um, we're ethics at worldcubeassociation.org. And you can email us if you've seen anything uh, that you think is suspicious. Um, and then, you know, we can corroborate that against the report, see if what the delegate has written in the report is lining up with what we've been told in the email, and then reach out to, you know, experienced competitors at the competition, see if they had the same take, see if they've noticed anything, if they've attended a lot of competitions with that delegate. Um, and, you know, when you give people responsibility, most of the people will be using it in the way it should be, and some people will be abusing it, sadly. That's why we're here. And that's why you can contact us. And uh, in the unlikely case that your delegate is doing something that they shouldn't be, then yeah, contact us and we'll look into it. Yeah. Uh, 
I was looking at a question that was uh, exactly just answered by what you just said, so I will try to move on. <laughs> um, so if uh, you have questions, write them in the chat and, uh, and we'll get to them. Um, this one, if robots are made for scrambling at official competition, will it be an issue of ethics since it's um, tough to check and verify for errors? Oh, wow. <laughs> <I mean. laughs> they, uh, they don't fall within WCA staff. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I, I think the bigger issue is, is with checking scrambles. And obviously that's more of a, a regulations issue. Um, and anything we would say on that would more so be from personal experience, I would gauge. <laughs> as, far as, as far as ethics involved in artificial intelligence and, uh, and machine learning goes, I'm not really uh, wanting to go down that rabbit hole right now. Um, <laughs> if, if, if we get official scrambling robots at a competition, we will uh, revisit this issue <laughs> when, they're, when they're implemented. Yeah, so uh, any questions? Um, if there's something we've talked about previously that you're not really um, sure about, um, that you would like some clarifications on, just ask me in chat and we'll get to it. If, uh, I mean, unless there's anything that you, uh, you feel like you haven't said that you would like people to know. I think we've touched on everything uh, that we had down at least. Um, like, yeah, um, I think we've covered. Well, most most of the purpose of, of this was to kind of give some insight into our committee because we only apply to a very small proportion of, of uh, the population of registered speed keepers. So we thought this would be a good opportunity to kind of give some insight as to what we do, who we are, um, how we operate. So I think hopefully we've accomplished that. Um, hopefully there's a, you all understand what we've been kind of doing behind the scenes the past couple of years. Um, but yeah, even if uh, you're watching this later on and you still have some questions, always feel free to reach out. Um, we're very open to uh, any, inquiries you might have regarding some concerns you might have pertaining to perhaps the code of ethics or of course uh, a WCA staff member. Yeah so just to uh, to say it again where can where can people contact you? Uh, they can reach us at ethics at worldcubeassociation.org. Um, you can find that contact email on uh, the contact us or about us page I think it's called um, on the worldcubeassociation.org homepage. Um, yeah, if you have questions uh, for us, uh, concerns about a staff member, um, or even suggestions, uh, we've had a couple of uh, rewording of points for the Code of Ethics suggested to us um, by email, which were uh, gratefully accepted. Uh, they were good. They clarified uh, a couple of points that uh, some people had per uh, problems with. Um, so, yeah. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, questions, uh, comments, comments, concerns, <laughs> yeah, send them our way and uh, we won't leave you in the dark like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, so thank you to everyone who were here and, uh, and asking questions. Um, you, this will be, uh, be uploaded on the, on the WCA's YouTube channel so you can watch it later. Um, yeah, thank you for uh, joining us for this Q&A session. Um, we might have uh, other Q&A sessions like this in the future with uh, other teams. So uh, yeah, you, you'll be able to see that on our social media. We'll make sure to notify about it. <laughs> thank you. For, Thanks for uh, everyone for participating. Okay.